look, it is inter interesting to be invited to uh, 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 talk to uh, greyhound industry participants uh, as a guide dog trainer, at which I've been for, for over 30 years. You know, in, in many ways, it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of you guys are thinking, well, what can this guy teach to us? And I'm not here to teach you anything. Uh, but I hope that some of the things that I show you today will be inspirational to you and maybe set you off on a learning journey, uh, much like the one that I've been under for 31 years. And I've got to tell you, I have not been a very good learner and it's taken me a long time to adapt to change. So yeah, as I say, uh, you know, in, in, it would surprise me if you think that uh, I've got a lot to teach you in, in terms of making dogs run fast. After all, uh, the guide dog industry is really about making dogs go quite slowly and steadily and that's, that's, how, uh, that's how we make our, our money. As I say, I've done that for 31 years and uh, it's been a fabulous career. Like all of you, what brought me to the industry is that I really love dogs and uh, can I just have a show of hands of everybody in this room who actually loves dogs? Yeah, I, I, I figured we'd have a 100% success rate on that and, and, and that's what binds us together. That's what makes these seminars and the future of uh, greyhounds, or greyhound racing in New South Wales very important because we do love our dogs and no matter what public perception and what noise is around, the truth is that we all do love our dogs. I actually do know a little bit more about greyhound racing than you might expect because a uh, little bit of a misspent youth at Olympic Park in Melbourne and uh, Cannington Park in uh, New South, well, at least in Western Australia, where I would have a few beers and have a few trifectas. Uh, probably a few more nights than I can actually remember. But during that time, I actually refined my capacity to choose slow dogs rather than fast dogs. And that's what brought me to the guide dog industry because that particular skill was something that I could use there and was a lot, costing me a lot less money. The fact is that we are in the same industry. We're in the working dog industry. Uh, assistance dogs, police dogs, racing dogs, farm dogs. We're all in that industry known as the working dog industry. So we share uh, many, many uh, challenges and many of the things we do, you know, uh, the, the knowledge base that we need is, is largely the same. So as I said earlier on, that, that a lot of the things that affect your industry affect my industry. And you know, some of those things are welfare, utilisation rates, public perception, cost, performance and wastage. Guide dogs sit in a kind of rarefied atmosphere where the public perception of what we do is very, very high. So around about 85% of people in the community think the welfare practices in guide dog schools are good or very good. Unfortunately, those same people think the welfare practices in the greyhound industry are not nearly as good. And that's something that really needs to be worked on in order to continue to have the social license to, to operate. Are we okay with that microphone? So today I'm not going to talk a lot about training because I don't know about training in your industry, uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my industry, about how we work, about the things that are important to us, uh, the things that are forcing change upon us, uh, which are many of the things that are forcing change upon you. If I'm lucky in this presentation, some of you will go away inspired to learn more and, and that's all I can hope. Uh, and I hope particularly that some of you go away wanting to learn a little bit more about the science of training. The science of training didn't come to me until very late in my working life. So like, in, like any working dog industry, mostly we, we're, uh, gee, that doesn't fit very well, does it? Uh, the culture of the industry is, is made up of our beliefs and our values and our behaviours. 
and it effectively makes a system of thought and, and you know within this room there will be many many people sharing common ideas about the way to go about doing things. Within guide dogs that's what we call our heritage. Trainers generally learn from industry mentors. The practices, the terminology, the forms and processes are influenced by history. So I can trace back some of the activities, some of the ideas that exist in my industry to a, a, a Russian captain by the name of Nikolai Lykov who was doing what I do in the 1930s. So there's a lot of history that we bring with us that affect what we do. The question is, is, is it reflective of contemporary knowledge and contemporary values? So, let me just talk a little bit about my experiences. I've been really, really lucky over my uh, 31 years in the industry. Uh, I've worked in a number of different countries and a number of different guide dog schools. Uh, guide Dogs Victoria was my home where I, where I learnt uh, how to train guide dogs and place them with blind people in, in the early 1980s. My journey's taken me to a range of different countries, Israel, Hungary, Croatia, Bosnia, Germany, uh, USA, and each of those opportunities has brought with it great learning experience for me. So I've been really advantaged by going outside of the group that I, I grew up with in the industry and learning from people who had a different cultural background to mine. Today my role is uh, Guide Dogs Victoria manager and I manage four departments. They're, they're uh, our breeding department, our puppy raising department, uh, our training department and also our client services department because it, within the guide dog industry it's very important when we place a dog with a blind or vision impaired person that we actually train that person in the skills of maintaining and continuing to reinforce the trained behaviours so that they make a successful partnership, a successful team. So a little bit about our, our breeding uh, department first. We breed around about 100 to 120 puppies per year in a purpose-built facility. Uh, we maintain a breed stock of around 25 females, around eight stud dogs and another 30 or so stud dogs on ice which is made up of, of uh, semen that we import from guide dog schools all over the world. So when you actually see our Labradors wandering around in the street, they're really not Labradors at all. They're, they've been purpose bred for so long that you could actually call them a specific bred guide dog. We have no outside genetic material other than guide dog material within our lines at all today. So we've bred a dog that is suited to the work that it does. Early on in uh, Australia, in, uh, in the history of guide dogs in Australia, we were using all sorts of dogs, um, Kelpie Labrador crosses, German Shepherds, uh, basically anything we could get our hands on. But over the years, as we refined our breeding program, we've bred very calm temperaments, we've bred very, very steady dogs, which is very important to meet the needs of, of our consumers, many of whom are becoming older and requiring a more steady dog than the dog that was suited in back in the 1930s. In the, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, many of the guide dog users themselves were war blind. So young men, fit, strong, and they were able to, to control a fairly robust dog like a big German Shepherd or, or a pretty crazy young Labby. These days, our, our average client age is getting older, plus community expectations of the way guide dogs behave in the community is, is much higher than it was back then. In order to improve our breed, we do something we, which is really fundamental to our success, and that's we gather data. And we gather data on the things that are important to us. And there'll be similar things within your industry that are important, and I can't identify them. Speed would be one, but, but there's others. For us, uh, soundness, in all sorts of environmental contexts. So we don't, we, we don't want a dog that's anxious or afraid going into a, um, a busy area like, um, like Pitt Street City during uh, rush hour. Dog's got to be stable and calm, otherwise it can't concentrate on its work. We want dogs that have high compliance. 
but we also want dogs that are keen to lead out and keen to work. So we, we measure around 20 different characteristics for each dog and we measure them a number of times. We measure them when the pup's eight weeks of old, we measure the dogs with the same characteristics when the dog is uh, coming into training at uh, 12 to 14 months of age and we measure them again midway through training. And through analysis of that data, we can, we can determine which of the characteristics are influenced most by environment and the way the dog's brought up and which can be influenced by the choice of breeders that we make. This is known as uh, estimated breeding values. Any of you who are involved in the cattle industry or any other rural industries would be familiar that uh, this is a, a science and technology that's, that's very widely used and it probably has a very good place within the uh, greyhound industry as well. Within our breeding department, we also do a lot of early development with uh, pups between uh, six weeks and eight weeks of age. So we start training them uh, at that age while they're still in the, in the whelping kennels. Dogs at eight weeks of age uh, are moved on to puppy raising. And puppy raising is all about early socialisation and it's a very critical part of developing a dog that's sound in all environments and comes to us ready to learn rather than needing a, a, a social experience to learn to be calm and secure in all of the environments that, are, that, that it will work in. Uh, it's absolutely critical and in recent times we've started to realise that Right. I guess in the past we, we, we tended to think that the breeding was 80 to 90 percent of it and the upbringing might, might have been 10 to 20 percent. Now we're pretty much at the 50-50. We see that yes we can influence genetics but the glass ceiling, that's the glass ceiling, but if we do more in terms of early puppy development we set these dogs up for success in the future and that's leading to improved success. But it's certainly an area that we're going to be concentrating more and more and more on in the future because this is important to our financial success, it's important to minimising wastage within our industry as well. So the dogs spend uh, around about 10 months with their puppy raisers, sometimes a little uh, more. They're uh, taught basic obedience and they're, they're uh, encouraged to take the dogs into all the environments that the dog might uh, be forced to work in when it's fully trained. So we look at the training component, which lasts about 20 weeks, runs from about the time the dog is 14 months of old, uh, 12 to 14 months of old, runs about four months or a little bit longer, 20 weeks in total, uh, mostly, although we're challenging that too by reducing the time it takes to train dogs. As we introduce more science into the training program, we're finding that the amount of time we need to spend training the dogs is actually reducing. And, and rather than getting lesser performance, we're actually increasing performance and reducing training time. So that's a good economic equation for us. Guiding behaviours aren't really that difficult and they can be summarised in, in terms of three things. Guide dogs are, are, are really there to provide uh, identification of trip hazards to the blind or vision impaired person. So that could be a step, uh, it could be just a lip in the concrete or, or, or any other any other uh, environmental thing that, that could cause a, a trip hazard for the blind person. They're also trying to avoid obstacles within the path of the person. And because the dog walks on the left of the person, that's mostly about providing sufficient space on the right side of the person and sufficient space overhead so that the person doesn't make contact with any obstacles. And the third thing that uh, dogs do is provide some support in navigation for blind people. So they can, they can uh, take the blind person directly to the door, for instance, which makes uh, finding the door uh, more easy for the, for the blind or vision impaired person. Or if that person is commuting over regular routes, the dog very quickly learns uh, the, the standard route that the person takes and, and tends to want to repeat it. And that's a naturally innate capacity that all dogs have. Every dog knows when, it, when it's uh, got to the front gate and ready to turn in on its, on its way home. In terms of client services, the matching of, of dogs to, to people, that's a really critical part of what we do. We select uh, applicants based on their capacity to control an animal. 
So the more controllable our animals are, the broader range of people, the less skilled people that we can take into our program. And that's really important to us too. Uh, and that's something that we couldn't do 30 years ago when many of our dogs were robust and highly energetic. We provide around about four to six weeks of direct training with those clients. More and more today, rather than just being the functional things, hang on to this and give the dog this command, we're actually doing a lot more in terms of empowering those people to use science-based training to teach their dog new things. And that has made a real difference to the sense of empowerment that our clients actually have. So they're able to do some pretty neat things with their dogs. And we also do a, a fair bit of uh, ongoing support for, uh, for clients in the field. So if their, their dog is attacked by another dog and is starting to become anxious about walk, uh, working, uh, we can go out there and, and uh, support them. So actually our service is all of life. Even today, uh, and it is a new age today, we, we even provide counselling and emotional support for people uh, at end stage management of their dog if, if uh, they're in a position where they might need to euthanise their, their uh, old dog. And we all know, everybody in this room knows uh, what a difficult thing that can be. So my role is, is to manage all of this uh, and it's look really with enthusiasm that I note that, uh, that the um, Greyhound New South Wales uh, new slogan is embracing change and I, I really love that. Uh, however, well I love it because it's a big part of my role. A big part of my role is to bring change to the industry that I'm in. Uh, my job description has all sorts of lines in it about uh, leading change and managing in a change environment and all of those things and uh, my employers think I've got the capacity to do that but if you knew my history you'd just know how difficult change has been for me uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about that just a little bit few of my experiences and, and how wooded headed I can be and how angry and upset I have been at various times when change has been imposed on me. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the guide dog industry has been largely uh, mentor to mentor teaching and I was taught 31 years ago by one of the pioneers uh, in the guide dog industry in Australia. He was taught by Captain Nikolai Lykoff in 1930. He came to Australia in the early 1950s to start the guide dog industry here and I was one of his uh, pupils. And he loved his dogs and he loved his work but the things that he taught me back then are not things that I could always be using today. A lot of great knowledge, but times have changed and we've had to change with them. So back then, the, the majority of, uh, of our technique was compulsion. Uh, dominance theory was the, um, the overriding philosophy that we worked under. Uh, and we used a lot of check collars, well, we exclusively used check collars and we never used food in training. So I just want to tell you a little story about my difficulties with change. One of which was with check collars because I argued black and blue that these were necessary because that's what I'd been taught. One day I decided to try, probably because somebody somewhere was, was I saw somebody doing it successfully and I thought I'll try that. And I did and the world didn't collapse around my shoulders. Uh, I wasn't that confident so I would carry my check collar around in my pocket. But over time I gradually decided that the check collar wasn't necessary. I didn't actually abandon it entirely. I put it in my drawer, it's just for, for safety's sake, if, in case I ever need this check collar, I've got it. And it probably took me 10 years, not 10 days, not 10 weeks, probably 10 years before I finally took that check collar out of that drawer and chucked it in the bin and was confident to go forth without it. Uh, now, <laughs> you know, I can't imagine why, why I ever needed it, but there was a time, well, a, a long time, when I, was, when I was arguing for the use of it and argued quite strongly, and uh, it did take me 10 years to, to change my mind on that one. So another one, another little story is about food, because food was absolutely forbidden within the guide dog industry. 
the concern was that if we used food to train our dogs, if we used that, that as a reinforcer for behaviour, it would increase the dog's interest in food in the environment. So you can imagine we're working our dogs through cafes and restaurants and all sorts of places where there may be food lying on the ground. <coughs> our dogs need to be able to ignore that, that food. So the, the, the general belief, that the effective the, uh, philosophy within the guide dog training group was that if you use food, your dog will become more interested in food and it will start to scavenge and lose interest in its work. But I was in, uh, I was in uh, Hungary in Budapest, I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a lovely city, and I was working alongside a, an Eastern European trainer. Christa, Christa was her name, and she had a, uh, she's a, a big girl, and she had this kind of big round labby beside her. As, uh, that she was working, training to be a guide dog. And I had this enormous German Shepherd. And my German Shepherd was going really, really, really well. I was so proud of this, this dog. And I was thinking, you're looking good, Paul. You're going down the street beside this girl. She'll learn a thing or two from you. We got to the first curb. Dogs are trained to stop at the curb. It's a trip hazard. I got there, I'm giving my dog a pat, telling him what a good boy he is, I'm feeling good, and I look over at Krista and she's feeding her dog. And I'm thinking, ah, I'm smarter than you, I don't need food. As we progressed further and further in towards the city centre, it got busier and busier, harder and harder and harder work for the dogs. And I'm still feeling pretty good and I'm watching Krista pop out the food every now and again and stuff it into the front end of her dog and I'm still feeling pretty clever, but then I started to notice something. And that was that her dog was working like a bloody champion and was working a lot better than mine. So I kind of had to have a bit of a think about that. My ego sort of got deflated a little bit. Uh, but I went home and had to think about it. And by that stage, I didn't have the check chain in my pocket anymore. So I had a free pocket. I could put a few bits of food in it. And next time I was out training, I very carefully took one piece of this dangerous thing called kibble, and at one stage I gave it to my dog. And the world did not cave in, which was fabulous. And gradually over time, I've used more and more and more and more and more food as a reinforcer. So today, in the early stages of a dog's training, we could be aiming to use 15 or more food reinforcers in less than 60 seconds of training when we're looking for peak learning. So that's a bit of a contrast from me going out with that one piece of kibble over a 30 minute training session and, and thinking it's, uh, uh, it, it's highly dangerous stuff. There's one other thing that I, uh, one other, I guess, example of my, my particular wood-headedness uh, that I would like to tell you about. And that, that was uh, an introduction I had to a, a, a academic animal behaviourists. One of those academics, don't actually know how to train a dog, but I'll tell you how. And his introduction to me was, you don't know what you're doing, you're doing everything wrong. Great, <laughs> yep, good, good start. Uh, I'll call him John because that's his actual name. Uh, So we didn't get off on a uh, very good start, and every time I would come up with a counter-argument to his, he'd just smash me. So he'd just you know, bury me uh, in science. And that was uh, not much fun. But sometime in our relationship, he asked me to go with him to spend a week with some really, really, really crazy people. And they're people who do dog dancing. You, in, you, you know the dog dancing stuff? Sometimes called dog sport, but they play music and dogs do all sorts of complicated behaviours. Uh, I thought, okay, a week with really, really crazy people. This is going to be fun. Uh, not. But I went there and they were doing stuff that I couldn't do. Like, they were doing lots of stuff that I couldn't do at the start of the week, and I got better as the week went by, and I went from zero respect to, wow, a lot of respect. And the impact, not straight away, but the impact over the next two to three years as we started to look at 
the techniques they were using and how we could bring that into our industry have been really, really huge. So I guess the, the, uh, you know, the message there is that uh, your change is difficult. Uh, and despite the fact that we like to think we're open for change, despite the fact that some of us are employed to execute change, change, change isn't easy at all. And, and we tend to believe that what we're doing is the right way because it's been working for us. And that makes it even more difficult to change. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's, the, uh, there's the awful stats on the perceptions of welfare within different industries. And 88% of people think that welfare of guide dogs is good. And that's, that's really nice. You know, our PR machine's out there working really nicely and all of our practices is good. Uh, and we go down and only 21% of people think the welfare of racing greyhounds is good. Now that doesn't mean anything. It's about public perception and public perception is really important in terms of maintaining our social licence to operate. So the journey of change for, for us is uh, recognising that organisational change is really about changes of individuals. It's not about a collective. Every individual plays their part in change. That not everybody is going to make those leaps, those changes at the same rate. And uh, our particular industry, the big change for us has been the adoption and the use of learning theory as the underpinning uh, philosophy of, of the way we go about all activities in relation to, to our dogs. So positive training, is, there's a few synonyms for that. Some, some people call it reward-based training, force-free training, pain-free, pain uh, reinforcement plus, uh, LEMA, which is uh, least intrusive to most aversive training, evidence-based training, science-based training. Uh, it has all sorts of names. So what is it? Uh, Positive trainers either uh, utilise positive reinforcement as their primary behaviour modification tool. Positive trainers use a behaviourism model to explain behaviour. And positive trainers move through other behaviour modification tools systematically from the least intrusive, intrusive or aversive to the most intrusive aversive. And if you go back to my early education with check chains, we were we had the pyramid upside down. So we were starting with compulsion and kind of being really restrictive on using rewards, one of which the most powerful re reward of all for our dogs, food, we were withholding completely. So who uses this uh, R plus training? Because who uses it really tells, tells us a lot about what the community attitudes to this are. Uh, Taronga Zoo. The RSPCA advocate for it. The Australian Veterinary Association advocates for this methodology. The Humane Society. Various, so this is Victoria Stillwell, there's these various uh, popular uh, trainers in the, in the uh, domestic dog world. The, Australia, uh, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behaviour. Other guide dog schools. some police dog units, some military dog units, and also uh, advocates of training of other animals such as chickens and horses and uh, hamsters as we saw in that first video. The Pet Professional Guild, the Association of Professional Dog <coughs> Trainers, the International Association of Animal Behaviour Consultants. So there's a lot of people out there and that, this is a pretty uh, infinite list, we could go on and on and on. So with all of this growing, growing public perception about the appropriate ways to be training dogs, we can't be doing something different and argue that our methodology is, is, is okay. So traditional training policy, uh, philosophy was based on dominance theory, as I mentioned. Uh, that's the, the hierarchical status of, of the dog is the cause of good or bad behaviour. It's testing us out when it does badly. Uh, it's based on using uh, punishment to decrease the chance of wrong behaviour occurring again. 
and it uses uh, physical coercion or ma manipulation to get the dog to behave in the way that we want. Uh, there are many pitfalls uh, and because time is ticking away I won't go through those uh, but the, the fact is that these, these methods do inhibit learning, they can lead to uh, aggression, they uh, are actually very difficult to execute effectively and they rely on teaching the dog what not to do rather than teaching the dog what to do. So positive training philosophy, it's based on learning theory and that is essentially that previ previously reinforced behaviour is actually the cause of good or bad behaviour. That incentive, providing positive reinforcement such as food, uh, using that to increase the likelihood of behaviours that we want occurring again. It's also important that, that the use of the, this particular uh, training philosophy uh, engages the animal in active learning, only reinforcing correct responses. So what's changed for us? New scientific data uh, has debunked dominance theory. Scientific data has, has proved the pitfalls of uh, punishment versus the effectiveness of positive reinforcement. And also for us, as I mentioned, we, we have an ageing population of guide dog users. They're just not in a position to apply the same level of physical control that was possible in the past. So by using uh, more positive methods, we're actually able to be more successful with our clients, which is what we're there for. Also, public perception and altered willingness to engage in confrontational techniques. So I'm telling you, 31 years ago, I was taught to give a double-handed correction with a check collar. That's just not going to wash anymore. Uh, I don't want to do it, uh, but the public simply won't tolerate that and we don't need it. So, so for us, uh, because we're training our dogs out on the street in the community, our training methods have to be very acceptable to, to the people who are seeing us every day. So benefits. Uh, of positive training have been increased in effectiveness of early bonding with the new handler, uh, increased in engagement with the handler in the presence of, of distraction, which is a problem for us in the real world, uh, an increased capacity of, of clients to problem solve for themselves using uh, learning theory as the basis for, for that problem solving. Uh, observable learning, so that's another thing that really came to us. Uh, our previous training techniques were kind of osmotic. We didn't see the change so rapidly. Now, using these techniques, we can see the dog learning. We can actually see the dog engaging in learning. Uh, and we get uh, increased responsiveness and motivation from our dogs uh, who are then more engaged in the actual training sessions. The training sessions can be longer and the dogs stay interested for longer. So we, we uh, are more effective in our training. Okie doke. So the benefits of, of this uh, positive training culture at GDV have been uh, that we're aligning with the best practice animal training recommendations, as I showed you earlier. Uh, positive public perception, which is so important to us, as it is to you. Uh, guide dogs in Australia rely on uh, donation. We're a, we're a charity based organisation, so it's very important for us to, to have a very good public perception. Uh, we have improved utilisation rates, we have improved quality and maximising the effective use of training time. So uh, despite the fact that we're a charity, we work on business lines, so there is a bottom uh, line to everything we do and as a manager, uh, most of my time is spent managing the budget and managing efficiencies in practice. And the other important thing that it retains Guide Dogs Victoria as, a, as an interna international innovator in the guide dog industry, which is really important to us. So there is resistance because change is challenging, the muscle memory and old habits are, are, are uh, comfortable. Uh, within the industry, they're still in pockets uh, there is a lack of a high level understanding of evidence based learning theory and also uh, 
circular arguments uh, propagated by the tradition that is our heritage. Another thing is that people will sometimes try a new technique and without a mercy in it, they'll have one little failure and then they'll abandon that change completely. Uh, and that's, that's, that's uh, uh, something called confirmation bias. And th so that when we try something new and it fails, we'll tend to believe that it's, it's because it's a, a, it's a flawed idea. Uh, and when we do something that works uh, in, a, in a traditional way, we'll tend to believe that it's because it's the right method. We, we've introduced this all of life concept with our dogs. So it's about positive training from the beginning to the end. Uh, and we have some policy around it. So, so the first one that I'll, I'll just read to you is handling and husbandry. All, ha all animals must be taught the skills they require to succeed in their current environment and circumstances. This is not limited to guide dog work and as such includes handling and husbandry tasks. The use of positive reinforcement must be maximised and the application of pos positive punishment must be minimised during all, all handling activities. That means getting a dog in and out of a box. That means any contact between human and animal. And point eight is animal training and animal learning. And I think this is a really important one. Guide Dogs Victoria believes that animals are capable of learning. And as, as such, all activity carried out in relation to that animal will result in some form of learning. That is, animals learn whether or not we're teaching them or not. We, you know, as, as uh, trainers, we tend to want to believe that the learning's going on when we're doing the training, but it's happening all the time. Active learning and promotion of agency, and agency, you could say, means free will, will be used to ensure higher levels of voluntary engagement from the animal, leading to enhanced performance outcomes. Positive training must be used first and foremost when considering training methods, as it is the most humane and effective training. It is also enjoyable for the animal, sets the animal up to succeed, and positively enhances the relationship between animal and handler. So, I'm just going to show a few videos about uh, uh, handling and husbandry. Uh, there are some positive welfare outcomes associated with these. Uh, and they are improved associa uh, positive associations to inoculate animals against fear uh, and improve ac improved active learning to promote free choice within the animal that leads to the outcome that we want. In all of these things, and I am rushing through because I'm sort of conscious of the time, um, put your hand up when you actually want me to, 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 uh, to stop. All good. Uh, in all our training plans for every activity we, we do with a dog, we establish clear goal behaviours. What is it that we actually want the dog to do? Importantly, we also understand the environmental context where these behaviours will be required. So, for example, and I know that barking is a, is a kind of important um, uh, issue within the industry at the moment. If we want dogs to learn to be quiet in the holding, the holding facility here, we need to train it in another environment, but we actually need to come into this environment and continue the training. So this is about uh, understanding where you want the behaviour to occur because if you don't train at some stage in that environment, the behaviour isn't likely to stick in that environment. So we do that, uh, we prepare the dogs to perform in the environment by, through what's, what's called classical conditioning, but it'll just be uh, going into that environment and making sure the dog is comfortable within that, within that environment at first. After the dog is comfortable within the environment, we'll start to shape the behaviour that we want through, through a process of operant conditioning. We generalise the behaviours across all the environments and we apply this philosophy to everything that we do. So I, I, I just wanted to show one, uh, one more slide which, which is sort of relevant to, to uh, one of the, you know, the hot topics at the moment, which is, which is barking and, uh, and the uh, control of barking within kennels. That's a big one for us. We want quiet kennels. And we, we, in Victoria, we have to have quiet kennels because we're, we're in the middle of, uh, of, of a uh, residential area and that residential area is populated by people with stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of money and so they can, they can exert quite a lot of influence on, on uh, our licence to operate in that 
area. We also want quiet kennels because it's less stress for the dogs within it and it's actually a whole lot less stress for the people working within it. So it's really important to us. We start at the beginning. So we start with, with puppies uh, inoculating them against barking uh, through the use of positive reinforcement for quiet from the beginning. So we don't have, we don't have uh, six and eight week old puppies barking a lot in kennels, they're quiet. When they come back to us after puppy raising, that's also a very stressful time for, for, uh, for dogs and that's when we can get escalation of barking. So we have a few little tricks that we apply then. One, during the intake phase, we usually bring about 10, 12 dogs in, all, all fresh to the kennels. We load up with staff, and, and fortunately we actually have volunteers too, so we load up with volunteers as well. So we have a, a, one, a two dogs, one person ratio, 12 hours a day for the first week. And any time a dog starts to behave in a way that we would not like the dog to be behaving, we step in and redirect that behaviour to something that we would like. So as soon as barking starts, we engage the dog in another activity and we positively reinforce that. Uh, I was asked early in the week, well, you know, what, what, what is the secret to teaching dogs not to bark? Now, I, I also have to tell you that in the past, my methodology 30 years ago for controlling barking would be to go in, grab the dog by the jowls, give him a shake, tell him to shut up, yell at him. So I'm yelling at him, he's yelling back at me. And, and it wasn't very effective. And, and it, you know, it, it, it wasn't particularly nice and wasn't enjoyable for me, certainly wasn't enjoyable for the dog. So the actual, uh, I've just got a graphic here uh, on how to control barking. And it's, it's actually very simple, but it actually requires quite a lot of work in order to be successful. What that is, is, is uh, basically reinforcing the absence of barking. So that's giving the dog something valued when it's quiet. Not worrying about barking, encouraging the behaviour not barking through positive reinforcement. And as you go through the process of training that through operant conditioning, the time between each reinforcement grows larger. So you might, might start by reinforcing just one second of quiet. Pretty soon you've got the dog being quiet for five seconds, later on for 30 seconds, then a minute, then 10 minutes, then, a, then an hour. And this just can be extended out. There's a fair bit of work involved, no doubt about that. And also a fair bit of generalisation involved as well. So if you were doing uh, control of barking at home, you'd certainly want to bring the dog into the holding panels and repeat that same training in there, uh, although, uh, because if you don't, it'll come unstuck when you change environments. That's just the nature of it. All right, I have a lot of other interesting stuff that I wanted to show you, but, but uh, that's it for me.